In this video, we're going to create the first screen for the game. However, in order to create it, we need to create a solution. A solution is just another name for a program. We're also going to create a project in the solution. A project is a way for us to group similar files together. You can think of it kind of like a building. The building is the solution, and the project is the rooms in the building. To create the solution, I'll click on the Visual Studio icon and open up Visual Studio. To create the files for the solution, you can either click on this new project link on the Visual Studio start page, or you can go up to the menu and click File, New, and select Project. Now we have a pop-up screen showing the different kind of templates for projects and solutions that Visual Studio understands. If you notice, over here on the left of the pop-up, we have Visual C Sharp programs, Visual Basic programs, Visual F Sharp, Visual C++, SQL Server. Make sure you have Visual C Sharp selected. Then select the Windows option, and it has a list of the standard Windows projects. Select WPF application. A WPF application uses Windows Presentation Foundation to display the screens. Another option would be a console application or a Windows Form application, but we're going to use WPF for this program. Now we need to give the solution and the project a name. At the bottom of the screen, in the Name text box, type in, in uppercase, WPF UI for Windows Presentation Foundation User Interface. And in the solution name, type in SOSCSRPG. When you create your own projects and your own solutions, you can give them whatever name you want, but please use these for this project in case you ever need to copy any source code from my version of the project to yours, then the names will match. If they don't match, there might be a problem. And now we need to select where we're going to store the solution and project files on the disk. I'm going to put this on my D drive. I normally have a directory named projects and I put everything in there. I'll select that folder, make sure that the create directory for solution is checked and click OK. Now Visual Studio has created our solution, our project, and the first screen that, of the project. In the upper right corner of Visual Studio is the Solution Explorer. This shows us all the files that are in our solution. And now we can see Solution SOS CSRPG, and then it shows all the projects. In this case, we just have the one project, WPF UI, and it shows us a few other things here. There's the configuration file, the app.xaml, and the main window.xaml. And the main window is what we're going to work with. In the big upper left section of Visual Studio is our workspace. And you should see that the main window.xaml file is open. And then there's also a tab for main window.xaml.cs. This XAML file is the definition for what our screen will look like. XAML stands for Extensible Application Markup Language. And it's how we define things in our screen. It's if we want to put a button someplace on the screen, this is where we would say what color the button is, how wide it is, how tall it is, what word is on the button, all that type of information. Your work area may have a split screen. It may show something that looks like this, and then it may also show the design mode. So this is what the XAML actually looks like. If you notice, it's a box here that says main window in the title. And if we click on the XAML, Here's the title of main window. Personally, I prefer to work in the XAML mode instead of the design mode. You can do some things with the design mode, but I find that the XAML, working directly with the XAML is much more accurate. So let's take a look at what's in this XAML file. It has a less than sign and the word window with a bunch of information and then a greater than sign. And if you notice at the end of the file, we have a less than sign with a slash in window. That's because in XAML, when you define something, in this case, we're defining the window, you need to have an opening tag and a closing tag. And the slash is how you close it. If you notice here, we also have grid. 
we have a grid opening tag and a slash grid closing tag. Now let's take a look at this window up here. We've got a bunch of information in here that we won't worry about right now, but we have a few attributes here for the window. The title, the height, and the width. So the window has a title and the value for that is main window. The window has a height and right now it's 350. It has a width that's 525. If we want to change how the window looks, we would change its attributes. So let's run this and see how the program looks right now. To run anything in Visual Studio, you can click this Start button up here. And here is our game. Right now it says Main Window, which is the title. Its height is 350 pixels and its width is 525 pixels. We also have this box here that we can use for debugging. Right now we won't worry about that. Now let's make a change to the XAML and see how the program changes. I can either click the X on the window to close it or I can go back up to the menu and click this red square. So let's change the title. I'm going to change it to Scott's Awesome Game. You can change it to whatever you want for your game. I'll save this and then run start. So now the title says Scott's Awesome Game. So when you change an attribute of one of your controls, it changes how the program looks. Let's close the program again and I'm going to change the height to 768 and the width to 1024. And now we have a much bigger window. And this is the size I want for the game. Now that our window is the size we want, we need to do the rest of the layout. A common way of doing layout on a XAML page is with a grid. We define rows and columns and we place the information in the row and column where we want it. For our game, we have three basic rows. We have this very top one where we're going to put the menu. We have this large one in the middle where we put the player information and all the game information. And we have this one at the bottom where we put the player's inventory and quests and then all the action buttons. We can also define a couple of columns here. We have this column on the left with the player information and their inventory and quest. And we have this big column on the right with all the game information and all the action controls. The menu at the top goes across the whole screen, so it goes across both columns. We'll eventually get into some more detail because this game section has two columns and two rows, but for right now we just want to get the big main screen figured out. So we'll have the three rows and the two columns. To define the rows and columns, we need to put that information between the grid opening tag and the grid closing tag. And we define the rows by typing the less than sign, then grid dot row definitions, and a greater than sign. And notice that Visual Studio created the closing tag for grid row definitions for us automatically. Also notice in row definitions, the R and the D are uppercase and the rest is lowercase. If I try doing the O in uppercase, we get these squiggly lines because Visual Studio says this is an error. There is nothing called capital R, capital O. But if I change it back to lowercase, Visual Studio is happy. Now I'll add the definitions for the three rows we have. The only thing we care about for each row is how high it's going to be, how tall it is. So that's the only attribute each row definition will have. There are a few things to notice here. The first one is as we define something, we kind of go further to the right. We go deeper and more detail. 
we have the grid here with its opening and closing tag and between those we have the grid row definitions so this is the definitions of the rows for this grid the parent grid then inside the grid row definitions we have each individual row definition each time we indent here it's a little lower level of detail and notice that we have three different values here for the height the first one is auto that tells XAML to figure out what's going to be inside that row and give it the exact height it needs. Don't give it any more, don't give it any less. The second row, the height is an asterisk. So that means give it all available space. And the third row is 225 for the height. That's the number of pixels tall it's going to be. So when our screen is drawn, the first row will only be as tall as it needs to be. This third row will be exactly 225 pixels tall, and the row in the middle will take up all the remaining space. Now we'll define the columns with grid dot column definitions. And between the grid dot column definition opening and closing tags, we'll define the width of each column. First one, we're going to make 250 pixels wide. And the next one, we're going to say, take up all the remaining space. So now we have the rows and the columns defined for the game layout. But if we run the program, we can't really see anything because we don't have any information in any of the rows and columns. Let's add a little quick test information just so we can see how it looks. To do this, I'm going to create some labels. These are just text phrases that we want to put on the screen. They're going to be inside the grid, so we need it between the grid opening and the grid closing tags. And we need to define what row and what column it's going to be in. So for this label, I'm going to say grid dot row equals zero and grid dot column equals zero and I'm going to say the content of that label is test then do a greater than sign and get the closing tag for the label a lot of times in programming when you start counting things like rows you start with zero the first row is row zero the second row is row one and for XAML grids, the rows start at the top and move down, and the columns start at the left and move right. So this label is going to be in the top row, in the left column, the leftmost column, and it's going to have the word test. Let's run this and see what it looks like. And there it is. It's in our first row and in the left column. I'll add a few more labels so we can see how the whole layout works. Now I've created a few more labels for different rows and columns, and I've also added a background color attribute to each label. So this first label will be in row zero, column zero, and it will say menu, and it will have a background color of Alice Blue. When you're first working on your layout for a grid, you may want to add background colors to the controls. That will help you see where things start and where they end. So we'll run this. Now we have a good idea of what the program looks like. Our menu is going to be up here, our player data is going to be here, our game data here, inventory quest down the lower left, and the combat and movement controls in the lower right. Something to notice with the menu is it's only in the first column. Let's stop the program. I'm going to change that label and add a new attribute. This is grid.columnSpan, and I'm going to put a 2 there. So that says in our columns, this particular label needs to go across column zero plus the next column. If we run this now, we'll see that this whole top row is Alice Blue because we said we want this label to span two columns, this first column and the second column. This is all we're going to do in this first lesson. But if you want to, you can play around with the grid, try changing the size, try changing the color, Get familiar with how the grid works. 
the important things to remember from this lesson are in XAML, you have starting tags and closing tags to define all the different objects and controls. Sometimes those controls have attributes like the title for the window, the height and the width. If you have a control between the starting and ending tags of another control, then this is a child control. So this grid is a child of the window. It exists in the window. These labels are all child controls of the grid. They exist within the grid. In XAML, every tag that has an opening needs to have a corresponding closing tag. There are some exceptions. For example, these row definitions, they don't have any child elements. So instead of having this whole closing tag, we could replace it with just a slash before the greater than. So this is self-closing. Here's the opening of the row definition, and here's sort of the closing of it. We can, we can do that for all of the row definitions, for all the column definitions, and even the labels, because we don't have anything here in between the opening tag and the closing tag. That makes the XAML a little shorter, a little cleaner, and if we run the program, it still works exactly the same. Another thing to remember is if you have a control inside a grid, you need to define the row and the column where the control should exist. If you don't, it's going to assume that this should go in row zero and column zero. Personally, I think it's better to always put in the row and the column because this way, if you ever change this, if you ever start moving things around, you already have those attributes defined and people don't get confused and make assumptions that could be wrong. In the description section below this video, I'll have links to the source code and to the support page. If you have any questions, you can either leave a, a comment on the video or go to the support page on my website and leave a comment there. It's probably better to leave your questions on the page on my site because the notifications work a little bit easier there and I'm less likely to miss something. That's it for this lesson and I'll see you in the next one.